Mm -hmm. Generally, Adam runs this meeting, so I guess he has not joined yet. Probably he will join soon. Yeah, Adam said he was going to be a little late. Okay. Uh, I guess somebody else can get started. In that case, like if you guys like it, I don't know, maybe you can get it started that it doesn't already and then Adam can join. Okay, share my screen. Okay, you can see it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, we, in MTV, wanted to show you the, our usage and plans uh, regarding the volume populators and what we already implemented. So uh, I guess we'll start. So small uh, background. Uh, we had the main feature in MTV in the latest version 2.4. It's about adding the OpenStack provider. So CDI uh, doesn't support OpenStack. And the uh, volume populators uh, was graduated in uh, add to beta in Kubernetes. Also, we saw that, we, saw, we know that Rev uh, have a new client uh, for VirtImage.io, which is VirtImage, uh, which use uh, uh, recent improvements of VirtImage.io. Uh, it is on the usage and volume populators feature uh, basically enable uh, to use it. Um, and uh, it was uh, some experience uh, when starting to implement uh, MTV version. Uh, we couldn't use uh, CDI together with uh, the volume populators because uh, at the beginning we we wanted to, to do it with uh, DVs, blank DV, to create the PV and so to use it, but uh, to create PVC and so on. But uh, the populated data was overridden. Uh, so basically, uh, we ended up uh, duplicating some of the logic in CDI. Um, in terms of support uh, for uh, volume populators in CDI, uh, it would enable us to read of the duplications and to use volume popu uh, populators more extensively. Okay, Tomas. Hi, can you hear me? Can somebody yeah. confirm? Yep, yeah. okay, cool. So let's start with VMware. That's about Simple one because we don't use populators there yet, although we pretty much would like. Anyway, so uh, for the war migrations and migrations to remote cluster, we still rely on CDI and on their importers. Uh, for the war migration, we still need the multi stage import with VDDK. And and uh, for core migration in recent MTV version, we changed things a little bit. The workflow is different, but it works only on local migrations to local cluster. And what prevented us from using the same technique with remote clusters, because we use, we use this is progress monitoring. We use the same technique that CDI does. We have a, a Prometheus matrix endpoint that stores the progress and, and the controller connects to it locally to the pod and grabs the metrics regularly. But for remote cluster, this obviously doesn't work. And we also looked at the approach of storing the progress in some CRD, let's say for in the pod. Uh, but there's a problem that we need the proper service account to do that, which we don't have, and we, it's difficult to manage from the forklift controller remotely. 
Uh, but for the code migrations to local cluster, we changed the flow and we got rid of the CDI importer. Uh, we use only blank DV to provision the PVs. And then we start the conversion pod which runs weird V2V and we let weird V2V to do the actual conversion and population of the data on the volumes. And um, then yes, and we run the grid V2V with fixed appliance that we built during the container creation, uh, container image creation and not in runtime. And um, next slide, please. But what to do now with all that is a little bit uncertain. As I said, we would like to use the populators, but that's a tricky thing because uh, from, from the Kubernetes perspective and their design, it should be used only to populate single PVs. But to import virtual machines, we often need to get uh, more than one disk, more than one PV and populate them at once and not separately. There, there were some, this was opened uh, as an issue on the volume populator library. We got some, let's say, ideas how to approach this, but none of this seems feasible or usable really in our case. So at the moment we're a little bit stuck because if we wanted to use the volume populators, we need to rewrite the controller from scratch which seems like a lot of work, but possibly doable. And uh, yes, as, as I already mentioned, having the populator with a proper service account would be useful, not only as for the progress monitoring, let's say, uh, but also it would enable us to, to let the populator create also the VM configuration record after the migration. So it wouldn't depend on, uh, on the forklift controller. And the reason to do that is because the weird V2V and the conversion or the populator pod knows what the actual final VM configuration is. And it would make things a little bit easier. But for that, we would need some assistance from CDI with deploying the populator on the remote cluster. Uh, without, without that, uh, we can't really change anything or approach feasibly the remote cluster scenario. And it would end up having the same fate as the warm migration that I'm just going to talk about in a second, because we don't have any reasonable way how to manage things on the remote cluster from forklift. And for our migration, there hasn't been any real change in the latest MTV version. In the conversion pod that we use for the migration, we are stuck on EL8 because what it uses is a bunch of unsupported features that are not in virtu 2 v anymore and that are not available on EL9. Uh, uh, yep, yeah, Richard, if you have any hey, comments. I have questions. I'm, I'm glad you linked to that um, issue that I opened ages ago. I mean, I see the answers there and I don't really understand what they even mean. So, um, yeah, I'd, I mean, it just seems a fundamental problem with volume populators that they only work with a single disk. So, um, and I don't know even how to even approach a solution to that. Um, of course, if you're if you're in the common case where you're where you only have a single disk to migrate, which is actually pretty common, then it's fine. So you, you might just say that, you know, we're, we're not going to support multi-disc um, VMs. Um, 
on warm migration what how does it work at the moment are we are we taking snapshots from um on vmware and doing all that stuff yes exactly it we're taking regular snapshots from vmware that we uh, grab a uh, transfer to the local storage and when we are decide that it's a cutover point we stop the vm uh, at vmware and we run with v2v with in place conversions well we first we first of course yeah we first get the last set of changes from the source and then we run with v2v with in place conversions okay yeah i, I mean i don't have anything really to say about that but um yeah we um, we thought for you know warm migration that we would um, add a sort of in place mode for Burt B2B to do this. I mean, I don't think it's a particularly great idea, but um, we don't really have any time to develop anything else. So um, I I'd, I'd be kind of interested to know from. We, we had that question last week about you know how popular is warm migration how important is it for customers you know can we go and ask um uh po's you know whether customers really are desperate for warm migration or not and that kind of th those sort of questions now if, if it turns out that customers are really really desperate for warm migration then um, we can go and talk to klaus about reprioritizing things but i, I think i would like to have some actual independent feedback on that question first. And and for the cold migration general scenario, uh, I know we were kind of looking at the volume populator, uh, use of the volume populator yourself. Did you manage to get to create some something or? I, I did. I, I would have to go and find it now, but it was incredibly stupid simple. It basically took your Volume populator that you uh, so, but, uh, yeah right so you I mean just for that. the for the for the single disk right not yeah the, yeah I mean that that seems to be like yeah. a kind of fundamental right, right, sort right. of not, limitation not for the multiple disk situation okay yeah I mean maybe that's something you could also find out from POs whether you know, whether multi disk configurations obviously you know it's a problem if you've got multi disk configurations that you'd never be able to migrate them if we just decided to abandon them but. Um, if they're incredibly rare, then maybe that's not a problem. I don't know. Um, well, I, I'm not sure if they that they are really rare. I, from what I recall from Ref, we got a bunch of cases or bugs that, that where people were actually struggling with some multi-disk conversions that we had to fix, solve. So I'm, I wouldn't really say it's rare. I, of course, I have, don't have any numbers, but I wouldn't really say it's rare. Yeah, I mean, one thing I said on that issue that you linked to is that, I mean, it could work that we would create a, a volume that was actually a file system volume, not a, not a, uh, like a block device volume. And then obviously you can just create one, like a QCAR2 file per disk. But I don't believe that, Coop, that Cooper had any way to boot that. So you'd end up having to do like a second copy afterwards, which um, is obviously less than ideal. So that makes a suggestion, but. If I may, yeah. about this this part, uh, back then we thought about the volume populator as a black box, right? We use it as is on the Kubernetes side, and we came to conclusion that we need to modify it. So we have a modified version of the controller, and as far as I uh, understand, also the CDI guys um, plan to 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 have a modified version. On their side and if, if we are going to modify the controller then we have an idea how to handle multiple volumes uh, as well it shouldn't be an issue it's just that at the beginning we really tried to avoid making any change to the to the library and use it as is and if it's not a function anymore then i think we can have a solution for the multiple uh, volume scenario i mean that would be i mean that would be great I, I can't believe that we're the only people that have this problem with volume populators i mean it, it seems like such an obvious problem with them that you know surely uh other people have looked at this and have a problem and and you know would want a solution as well i guess i don't know 
Yeah, it's that simple that maybe you can also propose it uh, to, to the upstream or to Kubernetes. Yeah, definitely. It won't be the first time. Okay, um, does anyone else have any other comments? If not, we can move on, I guess. Okay, that's uh, one. Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering what um, what the next steps are then, um, and I don't know how we can better collaborate on getting getting this done. Well, I would definitely like to um, hear from POs on how common war migration is, how many customers have ask for it, um, whether there are customers who, for example, are blocked because it takes too long to do a cold migration, all, all those sort of questions. And we'd need to feed all that back to uh, Klaus Kiwi. Um, so that would definitely be a next step from my point of view. Yes, that's an action item on us on MTV. Okay, and, and uh, the other thing I wanted to um, ask about is, uh, the, currently data volumes can it's confusing but you can um they ha, they allow a populate an external populator as a source um and i recall that some mention of you guys were like um duplicating some cdi functionality like regarding um storage profiles and file system overhead stuff and i was wondering if you've looked at because i You've written your own populator, I think, for um, Rev migration. So I'm wondering um, if it if it made if you've looked into and if it makes sense for you to uh, still use data volumes with that and give it your populator as the source, and that way you wouldn't have to um, duplicate the storage profile lookup stuff like that. Yes, it's mentioned later in the presentation that, that this is one of our goals. I mean, we started uh, something like half a year ago working on the on the populators. And back then, that, that source that you mentioned didn't exist in CDI. So as uh, uh, Tomas mentioned, or okay. Liran mentioned before, it was the blank uh, volumes. So yes, definitely, we want to leverage what you did and we want to get rid of the, the duplication. That's one of the goals. Okay. Okay, so we'll continue. So volume populator for uh, Overt. Uh, as said, it uses an uh, Overt image uh, that provided by Overt. There is an uh, issue that it was uh, basically proposed and uh, it's written in Python. And we have up to date recent uh, improvements and it only supports cold migration at the moment and insecure image transfer. Uh, this is the uh, Overt Volume Populator CRD, uh, at least the spec that uh, basically is the data, uh, data that we need to provide in order to create the migration. Um, and maybe you can use it as well in CDI. Uh, uh, as for uh, OpenStack, uh, it uh, downloads a single uh, image from Glance, it uses a uh, copper cloud, and this is an example of the OpenStack volume populator CRD uh, with the identity URL, image ID, secret. Um, as you can see in the status of both, uh, we basically posting the progress of the disk transfer uh, using the Prometheus uh, metrics. Okay, Benny. Can you hear me? Hi. Uh, so uh, in terms of architecture, uh, as mentioned by Ari before, we, we have a, a modified uh, version of the uh, of the reference implementation uh, controller. So we have a, like a very heavily modified version of, of it. And uh, in, in uh, Forklift, we create two instances of it, one, one to watch uh, uh, 
overt volume populator uh, uh, PVCs and one to watch uh, OpenStack uh, uh, volume populator PVCs. And uh, accordingly, we run the uh, relevant image for each one. The overt one uses overt uh, IMG. OpenStack uses the, the small uh, uh, Gopher Cloud uh, uh, program. And uh, in terms of progress reporting, it's pretty much uh, similar to, uh, to the CDI uh, approach, uh, where we update it via uh, a metrics uh, endpoint. Uh, and in terms of uh, usage of CDI in MTV24, uh, which is the first version where we use uh, volume populators, it is used in uh, war migration for uh, for Rev and VMware. It is used in migration currently to remote cluster because we still can't use the uh, volume populators. And in uh, cold migration from vSphere to uh, local uh, OCP clusters. Uh, OpenStack uh, doesn't use, uh, for obvious uh, reasons, still doesn't use uh, uh, CDI. Uh, so our path forward, uh, we want, like, the bottom line is that we want uh, to use uh, uh, CDI and to use uh, data volumes with our uh, volume populators uh, for many reasons that, that were already mentioned, like uh, removing the lo duplicate logic for reading the storage profile and, uh, and calculating the uh, file system overhead, as well as uh, enable migrations to remote clusters by having uh, CDI install our uh, CRDs and and uh, uh, run the pop the controller that will uh, watch them. Uh, another thing, this is uh, more more of a future. Uh, we still haven't looked into it. Too much, but another option is to uh, improve war migration for Rev uh, by uh, utilizing a fairly new uh, feature uh, that was added, uh, which is uh, incremental backup, uh, specifically hybrid, which which would work with both uh, cold and warm migrations. Uh, this theoretically, if if uh, uh, can uh, replace the usage of uh, creating snapshots and removing snapshot. Uh, and finally, it, uh, it gives us an opportunity to uh, perhaps uh, leverage uh, MTV to perform migration between uh, uh, different uh, uh, OCP virt uh, instances. Uh, Sorry, excuse yeah. me. Um, if I could just jump in on that previous slide, um, something that came to mind for me um, is the recent uh, virtual machine export capability that's been added to uh, uh, to Kubevert and and CDI. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, it's going to be important for us to kind of establish what the correct line between use cases is for those different features like we're not trying to implement mtv in uh cubevert or cdi but we are trying to provide some native kind of low level um you know inter like basically built-ins that allow you to to get data out of the cluster so i just wanted to point that out and uh, make sure you guys were aware of what's going there and we should definitely consider um making sure that we continue to talk um uh, to 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 get this right, you know, so that we're not stepping on toes and duplicating effort, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, it's it's not something that we like have uh, concrete plans or anything. Yeah, like yeah, that. and we honestly we weren't really sure what was going on with the um you know the uh you know cubevert to cubevert migration path, and we want to get that right with you guys, so. Anyway, that's all I had on that on that point. Okay. So this is just a small. Uh... That's it. Huh? That's this it, is the last slide. Yeah. 
Okay. So that's it. Yeah. If anyone has any additional questions? I think. Yeah. I was going to ask about that that thing you just talked about. What what's the metadata format that you're using? Um, and I really hope it's not OVF. And I wanted to say that it reminds me of export to OVA and uh, external providers in uh, in Rev. So yes, that was also a question that came to my mind. Adam, you mentioned the export. What the export is doing looks like? Yeah, so basically what the export is doing is implementing, I did a POC quite a while ago um, to show that you can export a virtual machine disk by just simply starting a pod that has a web server in it um, that's connected to the PVC and basically is willing to serve that up in various formats. Um, so it was really just a simple, you know, we're having, yeah, you can download the NQCOW2 format or whatever from, from the uh from the cluster um what we did expand it to do is to actually put the the vm uh yaml or the the vm definition uh in the export object so what's happening is you create a you create a virtual machine export um the target can be a pvc a vm or a vm snapshot and it will collect the resources associated with that spawn a pod um, attach the PVCs and have everything kind of just there. And then it just lives as an application on that cluster that's serving this up. And we have some certificates and things that are uh, making sure the data is protected. And that's all it really does today. We, um, we have an idea of some things we could do on the receiving side, because there's actually people I'm aware of that are trying to move VMs already between clusters and so we had this idea of you could create a virtual machine import object on the destination cluster that basically uses the export on the other side. But this is starting to get into that territory where I'm seeing the overlap. So like it doesn't make sense to do this twice. Um, right now it's low level building blocks um, and we wanted to do that on purpose so that we don't over engineer something and we have a chance to see how people use it, um, that sort of stuff. So um, VMware defined this format called OVA. Um, it has some good things. It has some terrible things about it's it. It's mostly garbage, if you ask me, but yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, that is a fair assessment. Um, but it does have some good ideas in there. So don't don't, don't just sort of jump to throw the whole thing away. Mm -hmm. um, OVF, the format, is absolute garbage. You're absolutely right. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's literally a dump of internal structures inside VMware's old database. Um, the good thing about OVA, I think, is the is this idea of encapsulating multiple disks in an uncompressed tarball. Um, it gives you like a file which which corresponds to multiple disks. In fact, there's mm -hmm. even a, a variation where you can have multiple VMs in a single file, which is you know useful, just useful to be able to copy that around. And using an uncompressed tar means that you actually are able to access the disk without having to actually uncompress, without actually having to expand the tar because you you can just look for offsets within the tarball. Mm -hmm. um, and and definitely exporting the metadata. Actually, I think your your choice of using YAML is a pretty good one. Really, I mean, it obviously means that it will only be applicable to other Kubert instances. But you know, for what you're talking about, that seems fine. And it's mm -hmm. obviously it's a lot better than OVF. So I, I would I would say that I think the lesson there is that having a, an OVA that perhaps contains the YAML and the disks and is not compressed and sort of follows some of that thinking behind OVA. Mm -hmm. but without the OVF component might yeah. actually not be a terrible idea. Yeah, and I really appreciate that context and probably we should have some follow-up conversations. We have mulled around the idea of what is the canonical virtual machine like uh, storage format for Kubevert. Right now, there is no storage format. It's just the raw elements and you can do what you want. So we thought that somebody might actually create an external library that knows how to pull down all these things and assemble them. Uh, there's another consideration for Kubevert where the, in, the kind of standard interchange in a Kubernetes cluster is a container registry. So, um, you know, we would want a format that would be pushable uh, in a container format, like say a container disk that maybe contains all of this stuff um, in, a, in a unit and container disks, uh, you know, a container, uh, OCI container format as a tar file as well. So we kind of had had thought about about this. Um, 
kind of the jury's out still on on what to do and we're trying to take real slow steps to make sure that we don't make any uh, dumb mistakes on a format like this but I definitely see there being a use for it there's challenges like for example layer size limitations in a container registry which are often much lower than a typical installed disk image size so um yeah, I'm definitely, this is something I think is really cool, um, an opportunity for collaboration between a few a few teams here for those who are interested. So let's definitely, you know, make sure we uh, get together on this instead of doing our own separate things is what I would say. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting you mentioned CDI. I mean, that was the main problem with CDI is it didn't define like the metadata as well. Mm -hmm. It was just a container for a single disk image. Yeah. Um, and you do yeah. need that metadata. You need to know you know, just basic stuff like how many, what, you know, what's the ideal number of vCPUs for this VM? Um, yeah, and so there's a few basic. things, like KubeVert has come up with this uh, instance types and preferences um, set up now where you can refer to these more in like a cloud native type of format, you know, where this is a small, uh, you know, Windows VM or something, and then those have meaning. I don't know, like that's another, thing that you know um fits in here because you could get away with maybe less metadata um but and anyway yeah michael is mentioning this persistent container disks below and this is kind of a related topic because we are considering what some extensions might be that actually put the the metadata in there and also enable a container disk to store multiple uh disk images and does that make sense how does that square with some of the other ways we've been using them so yeah it's some interesting topics there okay cool um i guess this is it from outside cool Thanks guys for coming to present about this. It spawned some really interesting topics and it was nice to see that. Um, I guess I'll take, I, I'm usually the moderator, but I didn't attend right on time today. So I'll take over here and bring up the next topic, which is Alex, uh, the data import cron GitHub issues. Yep. So uh, I still can see the screen by the way. Might yeah, I never started sharing. I can try to do that now if that's helpful. Let me go ahead and do that. And you can maybe you can just get started while I'm getting that set up. Sure. And I see it. So yeah, we have a couple of uh, data import cron GitHub issues. I just wanted to bring them up here so we can uh, make some action items out of them. Uh, the first one is pretty simple. Um, when you just go ahead and create a data import cron with a URL that's uh, that contains no tag, just the SHA, um, it gets expanded in the wrong way. It gets like a duplicated SHA, and uh, you can imagine that leads to import failures all over the place. Um, so we could fix that, but uh first i i wanted to know about the use case C can you pull from this type of url can you pull sure. it rather uh i'm after of this issue and i can say about our use case uh we are shipping kubevirt as part of our distribution with all the images which you can use for creating the images for example ubuntu centos and stuff like that uh, all our images have um, this tag generated, this digest generated, uh, and it can be updated since uh, the new release is coming for our platform. So we would like to manage data import cron and update those da tags uh, manually uh, instead of checking them um, by tags. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the workflow is that you would, you guys would be aware of a new SHA, and then you would come in and manually edit the spec of this data import cron, and then the, you would that would be the basically the logic that triggers triggers the updates. 
Yeah, exactly. I found that uh, the data import cron spec is immutable, so we also have to remove and create it again. But after all, it works with no problems mm -hmm. for yeah, all the existing data sources. Sure. Yeah, there's. I know that there have been other suggestions of, of use cases for having the spec mutable. Arnon would be familiar with a few of those. Uh, for example, if you're aware that the updated image requires more storage space, you may want to update the storage spec um, to a larger size, uh, for example. Or if you wanted to change the storage class uh, where the uh, you know where the images are uh, importing into. Um, so I don't know what we decided on on those topics or if there was a discussion around that. Adam, I. I don't really understand why would they use data procore and not simply the data source and update just update the data source with uh, the update oh, for, for the data use. source does not support specifying registry directly it supports to specify just pvc there are no other options importantly you, I, I think, think there's... this which also have to be implemented <laughs> So yeah. I think there's confusion on that because like we ha it's a it's actually regrettable because uh, data source ref is the same is like the same field that's used in the PVC spec, but we have a data source in the data volume spec which absolutely should support the registry source. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, but the problem is uh, we have um, some registry with all these images, and we have to somehow update this is those images like the new release is coming mm -hmm. and we update all the data import crones to update the images itself mm -hmm. if we would um, provide the url for images to our users i'm not sure it might be pretty confusing for them could you put this what we're well, i think what we're wondering is can you put this um stuff in the the actual data source instead of then the data import cron spec. You mean data source uh, of data volume or data source spec? Uh, maybe Arnon, would you would you clarify that in this particular case? So I think we can actually put. Uh, actually, in the data source spec, uh, the, uh, you can CR, create. So you cannot do it. You can put this URL for data volume, but you can't uh, specify registry source for kind mm -hmm. data source resource. Right. Okay. There is just only opportunity is PVC. Yeah. Uh, actually, What's the purpose? Uh, so the data source is pointing to the, the latest copy of whatever the data input on download. So what happens is when we detect a new version via a new SHA, we, uh, we download the uh, image into a new PVC and then update the data source to point to the new PVC. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's not the way you try to use the uh, data program is not how it was uh, designed to, to be used. You know, uh, you're pointing you a specific SHA, which is not, <laughs> which is trying to reinvent the wheel as we are looking uh, to, we are trying to pull the latest one, okay, the latest image. You shouldn't tell us what is the latest image. We, we, we are doing that uh, job for you, okay? So I, I, so I suppose if you wanted to manually um, import them, you could actually essentially just not use data import crons. And when you're aware of a new SHA, then you just create a new data source pointing to that SHA and then a data volume that imports from that data source. And then, um, or you could edit the old data source um, to point to have the new SHA reference I guess, right? So there. I guess if you're wanting to do a manual um, operation, it may make sense to just illustrate the whole piece rather than kind of overriding the... I'm just trying to summarize the discussion that I'm, I'm hearing. 
I would uh, repeat that you can specify the registry URL for data source from which you want to create the data volume, or you mean to create data volume from data volume. Yeah, that makes sense. But in this way, uh, the garbage collection will not work. We have two kinds of garbage collection. We have the garbage collection of uh, data volumes uh, created by the data import crown, and we have the garbage collection of general data volumes. Okay, which one are you referring to? I didn't get how it would work. Again, we have the the gener general uh, garbage collection, which works for all data volume created in uh, using the CDI. And uh, so each uh, data volume will be garbage collection by default when it's uh, done its work, when it's uh, successfully completed. And when you're working with data in Procon, you have a second level of garbage collection, which uh, says that the uh, uh, old uh, imports uh, will be a garbage collection. You see the line imports to keep? Yeah, yeah, that's the option it I'm talking about. Only the last two imports. Okay. So that's what you are, You that's what you want here, right? You want to keep the last two, uh, the last two PVCs, that's the functionality that you're interested in? Yep. Okay. So yeah, I think we have, I guess it's sort of like almost exposing the logic of what is the latest um, image. And I'm trying, where is that determined? Is that annotated somewhere um, in the, uh, in the status or like, where is that? Cause I'm just wondering if there's, um, I don't know the internals of how that's working, but at some point our data import cron is polling the registry and determining what the latest image is. And then it marks that down somewhere and then determines if a new, up, uh, a new imports required. So I guess I almost wonder is, can we also allow the latest image to be specified in the spec? Like, to say what it is. And if it's in the spec, then we don't have to do the check um, to the registry. And I would say that one cool thing about that approach could be that um, it could eventually be extended to work with, for example, HTTP, where there's no way to determine what the latest image is necessarily. But uh, that's a different topic, so let's not go there yet. But I'm wondering about that or non. So, where is the, in the status of a data import cron, we, we specify what the tag that represents the latest version is, correct? Uh, that sounds so very I, cool. Actually, we currently uh, have a polar running in mm -hmm. a containerized application, uh, which pulls from the last one. Yep. The, I don't really understand the, you, you want the data import to be uh, mutable? So the, so Arnon, the idea that I have, and like, I, I, this is like, you know, just talking about it so that somebody yeah. could implement it if they like is to, so the polar comes up with what the latest image is and it records that result somewhere. And if it's a declarative system, it's probably in the data import cron object somewhere. I'm guessing right. in the status. So I what I'm saying, annotation. it's an, okay. It's an annotate. What I'm suggesting is that it actually be made a proper first class citizen of the uh, status API first. So the status is, okay, the current or, you know, the, the latest tag equals uh, whatever that is, some SHA or whatever it is that we decide that is. Okay, that would be step one. Step two then would be, as we do for some of our other objects, we could actually mirror that as an optional field to be specified in the spec. Mm -hmm. And, and again, this is just an idea, you can shoot it down, but then if that's in the spec and if somebody were to specify the latest image is X, right? In that case, our polar wouldn't be looking anymore because it already knows the answer, it's in the spec. The latest image is X, so no polling necessary. And then it carries on with the- it. And it carries- 
we really support it uh, in way, way, one way or another because we are using that uh, mechanism in our uh, uh, tier one tests, in our functional test. Uh, you can, for example, disable completely the schedule uh, and uh, then you can, you just need to, uh, uh, to annotate the data hypochrome whenever you have a, a new, whenever you new, know of a new uh, tag or SHA. I, okay. I, I'm not sure we're supporting this format, I guess we don't, but we can easily, uh, we can easily fix it. And that way uh, you won't need to put the SHA here in the URL line, but you need to put it in the annotation. Okay. okay. And it will work smoothly for you. Maybe we need to tweak one line or two. So could, so that, I mean, let, let me just uh, defer uh, to see if that would be um, useful. It sounds like it might solve the use case here. So if so, then maybe uh, Arnon, you could just provide a few details in the, in, in the issue. Uh, and then you guys could try that. And if it works for you, we can figure out if we want to, you know, like if you guys would want to submit a PR to make that a more comfortable API, or if you're just happy with what it is. Yep. Okay, cool. So that, sounds, so that sounds like a plan. So I think the action on this is for Arnon to provide a couple yeah. of details about the annotation that's needed and maybe can how to specify the, the registry URL in that case. Can you please tag me on the GitHub issue? So basically, it's okay with you that you disable completely the schedule, right? Because you don't need the, the polling. You are doing it from your side, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Seems so. Okay, cool. All right, so let's try, just in the interest of time, let's try to move on to the next issue. So um, this would be for Alex. Can you come back with this one? Yeah, of course. Um, Okay, so here we need a little bit of grooming because we, we kind of started off with one issue, but then uh, that that uh, resolved successfully. And then down the line, we hit another one. Okay. So I, I, think the, I think the conclusion here is that we have a problem with secret uh, refs on data input crons. Um, Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, the main problem here that if you want to import some image, you have to create a secret twice. First time in a NIP space where the actually data volume is located. And the second one in CDI namespace because uh, checking uh, the cron job, which is checking uh, images also requires this secret. As far as I remember, we solved it uh, about a year ago. We solved it for config maps, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But we never had a use case with secrets, which is completely valid, I think, because you, you just need uh, credentials, right? Mm, okay. Cool. Hmm. Um, I just want to make sure the secrets are the problem here. Also, if you're not using the polar anymore because you've disabled the schedule, then I guess you could forego the secret in the CDI namespace, right? Yeah. So maybe, a, I mean, not, not to say that this isn't a problem for somebody who is wanting to do the polling, so we shouldn't forget about it, but in terms of your immediate needs. So I think what should probably happen is... No, that, we, that will not work because uh, the initial cron job is always created. Oh, yeah, even if there's no schedule or schedule is specified to run never? Uh, never tried that yet. Um, okay. I thought that every time you're creating cron job and if there is no data source or empty data source, it will create initial job for checking yeah, it and, right? I'm afraid you're right, but uh, 
so this uh, this would be need this will need to be sold uh, also for your previous uh, issue. Oh, okay. okay. So um, that can be something when you're looking at that other issue. That sounds like yeah. I think that if uh, data import cron is created with a a never schedule. I mean, I think it, it makes sense if there's any schedule whatsoever, it should do the initial one immediately upon creation and not wait till the next interval. But if the schedule is explicitly disabled, um, then it should probably, you know, with all zeros or whatever, then it should probably not create one. <laughs> Right. And of course, that should behavior should be documented. Agree. Okay, so that sort of is a uh, orthogonal <laughs> to this issue in a way, because um, I think there still is an issue of uh, secrets needing to be in two places. And I don't know if that can be, can that be solved? I guess we'd have one in the CDI namespace for the data import cron. And then it would be copied out to where it needs to go, probably by the controller, um, and managed that way for the actual import operation. Yeah, and then we'd have uh, we'd have to give some secret R back to our controller, which okay, is also so a discussion topic. So there are two uh, elements to this. I'm just going to try to mention that. So, um, if scheduling is disabled, then um, an initial import should never be scheduled or should never be completed, attempted. And two, um, uh, secrets should only need to be provided once in the CDI namespace. CDI should manage any secrets that are required or importing by copying them to the relevant namespace. So I think that seems like the approach forward. Um, any Anyone disagree with that or shall I submit that as a result of this discussion? Seems good to me. Okay, so we'll do that. I don't know what that means or who would take that, but I think that adds some clarity at least for now. Okay, um, anything else on this one for the, for the time being? Okay, all right, so let's pop back. I don't know if why don't we try to pick up uh, this la this topic here? And unfortunately, Michael, we may have to defer the persistent container disks until next time to to address it properly. So let's take on the LVM on shared LUN config. Just simple question: If anybody use LVM on shared LUN, uh, which CSI drivers you use, or which methods you use to populate this? Probably no one. Okay, we can skip that. Yeah, I'm Somebody. just trying to. I'm trying to give it a little bit of thought, just to mean to be exactly sure, like what you mean. So is this the idea that you have a uh, an iSCSI LUN, for example, that's um, given to a VM in the form of a PV, and the VM is initializing LVM from the guest perspective there, or something else? Yes, exactly. Uh, pretty okay. common configuration when you have some mm -hmm. black storage box, you exporting the block sure. device yep. over iSCSI or fiber channel, then you use LVM to uh, cut the LVs for every virtual machine. Oh, so th that sounds like a different thing though. So that's what I was trying to differentiate between because 
you can have this idea of partitioning a very large iSCSI LUN into multiple LVM devices. This is something that, uh, for example, Overt does. Um, or you can have the idea of one iSCSI connection or LUN corresponds to one disk. Um, so uh, those are two. And then, and then in the case of the one LUN per disk, then I was asking if it's the operating system inside of the virtual machine that is taking that block device and creating LVM for itself on the device. But it sounds like you're discussing um, partitioning a large LUN uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The Kubernetes storage layer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there is a, I know of a project, but that's not shared LUN, that's um, Topo LVM, uh, which is doing that for local storage devices. Uh, I'm going to check that. And one note about Topo LVM, the way it works, it would just uh, loop over. Um, the available devices you have and we'll just utilize them, throw it, throw them in the LVM pool. Yeah. So but it does that, have, yeah. It has no uh, multi node awareness there. So there wouldn't be any kind of locking or anything on those, uh, on those devices currently for that. So I wouldn't be surprised if, um, other storage drivers may be doing something like that, but I'm not aware of any, um, specifically okay i found one driver which is called c size unlock lvm it seems should work oh cool yeah yeah uh, sandlock is the tech that's used by over to do the locking of of luns so yeah yeah but it is pretty complicated and does not work as expected so i'm going to find the repository which will be useful easy to use and going to contribute to it to add cluster LVM support or to fix this driver. I just wanted to know if anybody yeah. used that. That's super anyway, interesting. I'd love to hear your, uh, I'd love to hear uh, an update from that after you've taken a look, because uh, I think that would be a pretty cool uh, use case. I think I'll have something to tell next storage meeting. Okay, awesome. All right, so with that, we have, uh, we're about two minutes from the top of the hour. So I'd like to kind of close down. Is there anybody with a burning quick topic they want to uh, get across here before we uh, wrap it up today? Just a quick question about the uh, persistent container disk. Is, is this, uh, uh, would something like this enable the NVIDIA use case that they demoed in the summit? Is, is that what uh, persistent uh, in fear, well, so if if the node has the image in the you know docker cache or whatever, then I think it would be functionally the same thing, but I think you know, um that's a big if, you know uh, otherwise, I, I think that's the main I mean, we can we'll talk more about it next time, but I think that's the main advantage you can. If the image is in the cache, you get your VM can get provisioned and started really quickly. But if it's not, you still have to pull the image and it'll you know take a while. And then at that point, I don't think there's much of an advantage to it, but we can talk about it. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we're basically out of time. Uh, thanks to everyone for your presentations and and topics had some interesting discussions today as always um appreciate that and i hope you all have a good week and we'll see you back here in two weeks for the next uh, installment thanks thank everybody you, thank all you right. bye bye bye